good morning, Southwest Christian. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, I hope you're having a great start to your new year so far. Um, if you would, go ahead and stand with us this morning, and we're going to begin our time of worship. <laughs> I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry the kind of away? It was my turn Till I met you I was reeling the night failures I tried to hide It was my time till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glory You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now your mercy saved my soul. Yeah. 
the guilty one walks free death would be his portion and our portion liberty our chains are gone our chains As I uh, come to our time of communion devotion this morning, if the ushers want to go ahead and pass out the uh, communion while well, I'm going through this devotion, then we'll take communion together at the end of it. I'd like to read this morning from John chapter 15, and it's verses 1 through 8. And this was, the, of course, the Last Supper as Jesus was given final instructions to us and to his disciples. And he had this to say, starting with verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done. This is my father, to my Father's glory that you, hear much, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So it's pretty plain in those eight verses what Jesus was telling us, that we must always remain in him, that we cannot be apart from him. But the thing I wanted to draw attention to in those eight verses is seven times in that, that discourse, he talks about bearing fruit. And what kind of fruit is he talking about? 
Paul tells us that in Galatians uh, chapter 5. There are nine fruits, fruit of the Spirit. And here's what he's talking about. My application Bible goes ahead to describe um, the fruit of the Spirit from verse five, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is a spontaneous work of the Holy Spirit in us. The Spirit produces these character traits that are found in the nature of Christ. They are the byproducts of Christ's control. We can't obtain them by trying to get them without his help. If you want the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, we must join our lives to him, just as he told us to do. And here's what I really like in this application. We must know him, love him, remember him, and imitate him. Know him, love him, remember him, and imitate him. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you for this glorious day, Lord. We thank you for your word, for the truth of your word that you left with us. We thank you, Father, for the... Holy Spirit, to guide and direct our way each and every day. May we always walk a path that is pleasing to you, Lord. And may we always know you, love you, remember you, and imitate you. So we take these emblems, Lord, the, the bread that represents the body you gave and the juice that res represents the blood that you sh shed. Lord, we just, we know you gave it all for us. We celebrate your victory over death, and we celebrate our victory by remaining in you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you just want to take a minute, go ahead and take communion. I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering, too. So if the ushers want to go ahead and bring those offering plates around, let's just, let's just pray over that. Jesus, we thank you for the blessings of life. We know that all things come from you and that we are just custodians here. So as we bring these gifts and these fruits, Lord, to you, we pray that you would just use them in a great and mighty way, Lord, that uh, wherever the need and whatever the need, that only you can accomplish. In your name we pray. Amen. count on one thing this same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things out oh yes I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name, oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy in all my days, oh, yes, I will. I 
I count on one thing The same God never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Oh yes I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes I will bless your name, oh yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on oh, my days, oh yes I will, oh all my days, oh yes I will, and I choose to praise, to glory. To glorify, to glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, to glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Yes, I will let you hide in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I and learning from God's word just ask you a quick question how many of you are willing to say yes I will right now just say yes I will now do you know what you're saying yes I will to right <laughs> it doesn't matter all right yeah whatever God is calling us to this day uh, whether that changes during the sermon or the convictions of the Holy Spirit on this today we're saying yes I will that we're going to follow after God with all of our heart soul mind and strength you know, that's the whole concept of this idea of build. Now, before we jump into that, I want to put us in the right state of mind, so let us pray together and give glory to God. Father, we worship you. We praise you. We lift your name high because you are so worthy of it. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. For you, Jesus, dying on the cross for us, for paying the price that we couldn't pay. You're the one, Lord Jesus. Thank you. As we study the truth of your word here this day, as we... Listen and ask you, Holy Spirit, to work in us. We pray for your guidance and direction. We pray for a new past, new ways, new hope, new strength. Uh, we just pray that you would show us and guide us in all the ways of our lives. God, we just thank you for your love, your grace. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, to get us thinking today, how many of you right now at your house uh, or your work or where, whatever it is uh, have a project that really needs to be done. Anybody got that messy desk that's got papers all over it? Got the closet that really needs to be cleaned out? Any of you ever have that where you have so much stuff piled up that you know that there's something growing behind it, need to be dealt with? Now, the reason I bring all that up and want to stir that in your minds is because I want you to think, um, a lot of what we ask in church and as we study the truth of the Bible uh, it can be daunting. Uh, you know, we can look at those things and we can hear scriptures and look at the slides and go, well, golly, I'm, I'm a long ways off from that. Or, or my Christian faith, my maturity is far from what we talked about in the, in the service today. What I want you to understand is this. We have to start from a point. And sometimes when we look at projects and we see them as so daunting and so uh, hard to overcome, you have to start somewhere. And every big life-changing event that takes place in our lives, things that will change the path in the future, starts with a choice that we make today that it's going to be different. You know, we have this little picture up here in front of the pulpit where uh, uh, we have this word authority. 
Last week we talked about that in the start of this series is that it is the authority of God, it is the authority of Jesus that establishes all this. That is a first piece of the puzzle. Uh, today as we look again at this series of build, build stands for builders, you and I, that's an active word. We're not just merely uh, uh, particip- or not just people sitting here today as being entertained. We are participants. We are builders. Uh, the next part of that is unifying in love and discipleship. And that's a big part that we're going through in this series. What is it to be a disciple, and how are we in turn to make other disciples? Now, before I do that, any of you ever look on the internet, Facebook, any of you guys ever been on the web, surf the web? Probably nobody in this room, maybe just me. I would say probably every one of you have been on a computer or something of that nature. Well, every once in a while, you come across these things like this, uh, this site. It's called gotquestions.org, and uh, it's, the question was, what is a Christian? Well, I'm always kind of skeptical, but I thought, well, you know, kind of going through this in church and stuff. Let me take just a quick read of this. And actually, it turned out to be a pretty good answer. So I wanted to read it to you today. A dictionary definition of a Christian would be something similar to a person professing belief in Jesus as the Christ or in the religion based on the teachings of Jesus. While this is a good starting point, like many dictionary definitions, it falls somewhat short of really communicating the biblical truth of what it means to be a Christian. The word Christian is used three times in the New Testament. Followers of Jesus Christ were first called Christians in Antioch in Acts 11.26 because of their behavior, activity, and speech were like Christ. The word Christian literally means belonging to the party of Christ or a follower of Christ. Unfortunately, over time, the word Christian has lost a great deal of its significance and is often used of someone who is religious or has high moral values but who may or may not be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Many people who do not believe and trust in Jesus Christ consider themselves Christians simply because they go to church or they live in a Christian nation. But going to church, serving those less fortunate than you, or being a good person does not make you a Christian. Going to church uh, does not make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. Being a member of a church, attending services regularly, and giving to the work of the church does not make you a Christian. The Bible teaches that the good works we do cannot make us acceptable to God. In Titus 3, 5, it says, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So a Christian is someone who has been born again by God and has put faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves it is a gift from God. A true Christian is a person who has put faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ including his death on the cross as payment for sins and his resurrection on the third day. John 1 12 tells us yet to all who received him to those who believed in his name He gave the right to become children of God. The mark of a true Christian is love for others and obedience to God's word. A true Christian is indeed a child of God, a part of God's true family, and one who has been given new life in Jesus Christ. I thought that was a pretty good definition. Some of those misconceptions that were listed in there about, uh, you know, just attending and that we're a Christian nation. And, you know, we hear these kind of things before when we see it on the media and stuff, when when we lose a soldier or something, they assume that because they're from America that they're a Christian. They may have very well been a Christian, but that's not based on them coming from America or because their mom and dad were Christians. It's because they had willingly surrendered their lives to the message and truth of who Jesus Christ is, the factual truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He lived here on this earth. He gave his life. He died on the cross. He paid the price for our sins. That is how a person becomes Christian. So today... We're going to be looking at building block number two. I need a volunteer to come up and put on our next puzzle piece. Anybody want to venture out and put up the next puzzle piece? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Maddie says Cody is. And they're getting married, so you have to do what she says. So, Cody, come on up. 
in July, right? June, May. Okay, I've, I've got it on my calendar. I've got it on my calendar. I really do. All right. So our next puzzle piece is ID. And Melinda helped me with this one, I'll let you know, because our word is identity. We're going to be looking at our identity and how we see it. So we're going with the short ID, and this is our smallest puzzle piece, and it wouldn't fit on there. So anyways, if you would like to figure out where that goes on the puzzle, he's an engineer, he'll get this. It's a tough one. I didn't make it easy. There are no edges. <laughs> you better be because it's all right I'll help you out because it is a difficult one but I'll let you do the drilling you guys isn't that impressive all right I'll hold it up here we're gonna go right here and we need to make sure and get it in the right spot so do you see the pin mark on that side We only have 10 more pieces to go. All right, there's two more. And that's kind of the big part of this whole picture here is that a lot of times it looks kind of discombobulated until we get to the end. And you know, as we look at our own Christian walk, that's the way it's gonna look. You know, we don't have to have it all together in this room. And, you know, with a lot of Christianity, we see this picture of people putting on this mask, wanting everybody to think they have it all together, but we're really in a building process, and that takes time. And so as we work at it and the pieces come together, all of a sudden things start to look different. Now, here's the deal. If we are not changing or our identity is not, um, we're not looking different from being in that relationship with Jesus, there's something wrong that we need to address. So again, building block number two is our identity. Now, as we look at our identity, a lot of you have heard me say in this church before, one of the things that bothers me most about people that claim to be Jesus Christ is when they walk around with Eeyore syndrome. You guys know what the Eeyore syndrome is, right? Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Oh, woe is me. Oh, life's terrible. Oh, nothing's working out. And I get it. Sometimes life is terrible. You do go through tough things. But as a Christian man or woman, we're learning and growing in Jesus. And we're learning how to be strong in that relationship with Jesus. We're allowing him to come in and change us. And so there's going to be bad days. Don't get me wrong with that. But I mean, as Christian people, I want you to learn, teach you how to be strong and grow in that relationship to be disciples of Christ. So as we look at identity... I want to point out to you the Christian names of meaning and definition by Baker's Bible Dictionary. Uh, this is what it said. The New Testament contains over 175 names, descriptive titles, and figures of speech referring to Christians applicable bo uh, to both the individual and the group. The reason I want to put this for you is a lot of you have probably seen these posters and things that have the name of Jesus and all the different names of Jesus in the Bible. But do you really realize how many titles and names there are for you individually? Any of you that have claimed Jesus Christ, there's a number of titles. And so I put a bunch of these words up there for us. So if you want to participate, read out loud as you see the words pop up here on the screen. The first is disciples. That's what we're talking about in this whole series. What is a disciple and how do we make more disciples? The next, witnesses. Salt of the earth. The body of Christ. The chosen, followers of the way, Christ followers, a royal priesthood, children of the resurrection, obedient children, the elect, members of the family of God, the redeemed, ambassadors, a holy people, bride of Christ, Nazarenes, brotherhood of believers, salt, the temple of God, brothers, believers, instruments for noble purposes, children of God, the righteous, God's offspring, children of light, 
and saints. And that's just a few of them. But the reason I want to put all the titles up there and for us to see those is because this is our identity. And I know that in life and when we're growing up and we're going through things, we have so many things that are make up our identity. But when we come to know Jesus Christ, this is our new identity. Let me ask you a question. How many of you read those descriptors, those titles, those names up there and, and think, oh, those are weak. Those are sad. Those are poor. Those are, is it any of that kind of stuff? No, when it says well, we're a child of God and all these descriptions are up there, I am now a Christian. Y'all know that? I'm a Christian. That means, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm all these things. My identity is based in God and Jesus Christ. That's why when we ask that question, on a scale of 1 to 10, how righteous do you feel in this room today? Well, you know, if you don't know this illustration, which all of you that have been around Central or Southwest here probably do know, uh, when you say those things, most of it's probably answered not very high. But when we say Jesus Christ and we ask that question, well, you're saying a 10. That's why so many of us are here or we're conditioned to that. We know that when we say on a scale of 1 to 10, how righteous are you? As a Christian, we say 10. Because my righteousness is not based in me, just like the descriptor and definition that we've read from that got questions about what a Christian is. as someone who is redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. As we move on here, uh, Douglas Buckwalter, which was the one that had written that article, said in Revelation 3.12, Jesus promised to give the believers the name of God, the name of the city of God, the new Jerusalem, and his own new name. This means nothing short of an inseparable identification and perfect union of all believers eternally with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you catch all this? I mean, are you really letting it sink in? It'd be like me standing up here today. If I was your dad or your grandpa or whoever, and I'm telling you, man, you're awesome. You guys are wonderful. You're good looking. You're smart. You're great. You're the best. Don't let anything get you down. You're worth it. Doesn't that feel good? But you know, a lot of people grow up with, you can't do it. You're not good enough. You're a loser. You stink. You have all these problems, and we hear those kind of things. And then we make our identity part of that. What we're going to look on here is this phrase here, I am a disciple of Jesus. Can you say that? I am a disciple of Jesus. Say it again. I am a disciple of Jesus. When we say I'm a disciple of Jesus, that literally means that we're becoming more like Jesus on a daily basis. If we look at what the Word of God says here in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus said, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. There was nothing more important. All of a sudden, they had changed everything that they were about, being fishers, going out into the sea, catching fish, to becoming fishers of men. This is the message, the great commission of God is that we are called to become fishers of men. So how do we do this? How do I change? A disciple, and we've been hearing some of this already this morning, a disciple is, and these are action words, following. Who are we following? Jesus Christ. And how are we doing that? Well, every day we're learning, we're growing, we're maturing, or we should be doing that. As we're following, we are changing. We just heard the fruit of the Spirit. Notice it wasn't the fruits of the Spirit, it was the fruit of the Spirit. And as we come into this relationship and the Holy Spirit's in us, we're going to become more gentle. We're going to become more full of goodness and faithfulness and love and patience and kindness. All these things are the fruit of the Spirit. We are changing. And the last one is we're reproducing. That means other people from those relationships and seeing how you're walking with Jesus are coming to know Jesus as well. Disciple. I am a disciple of Jesus. Now, this requires a choice. And again today, any of you have that closet at home or the project? It requires a choice. I remember when I first got married and moved to Springfield, Illinois, Mandy and I bought our first house. 
And I remember there was a project that we wanted to start it. I knew nothing of what to do or how to do it, but I did know how to tear stuff up. And, you know, being at that stage of life and not really knowing, I just started ripping things apart. Well, guess what? Once you rip it apart, someone's got to fix it. Even if you don't know how, you're going to figure out how to do it. This is what we're talking about at this stage of authority and identity. We're ripping apart those things. And this gets kind of deep. Because when we talk about the identity of Christ and the identity of me being a Christian, that means that everything about me goes back to the identity of truth. So whether I feel something, whether um, my own way of growing up or who I was, what family I was born in or, or what kind of money I have or, or even this whole idea of sexuality and things that we talk about in our culture so much today, and understand this. When I say a term like sexuality, I'm not talking about homosexuality, heterosexuality. I'm talking about sexuality as a whole. God references all of it. My identity is not made up in those things. My identity as a Christian man of God goes back to who Jesus Christ is and the truth. So if my feelings, my emotions, my economics, my, my way of growing up, my family I was born in doesn't match up to that, then I mean changed as I'm a follower of Jesus Christ to his way in truth, his life. And that brings us to the first one. It's a choice of the head, then it's a choice of the heart, and a choice of the hands. As we look at this, the first one is the head. And as we talk about that, this last week, just lo and behold, I had the opportunity to listen to a brain expert for half an hour. I don't know how these things come about, but for some reason I was in a Zoom meeting with a brain expert that was talking about the way we program, program our minds. Do you all realize that right now, and this is what he talked about, that as I'm talking, that you are all talking to your own brain in hundreds of words faster than I can speak out here right now. You know, that you're having this relationship, that you're reacting to things I'm saying, and that you're telling your brain things. What he went on to talk about is that what we say to our brain is that we're programming it and we're literally rewiring our brains on a daily basis. So if I'm constantly telling my brain, I can't do it. You know, like he used the example of a, a girl that he had in college and he was teaching math. And this girl said, you know what, I'm a C student. I just don't get math that well, I can only get a C. And so her very first test in his uh, college course, she got an A. And he's like, sat down with her, and he couldn't wait to hear what she said because he knew that she said she was a C student. Well, her response back to him was, you know, he's like, well, what do you think? Now you got an A on this test. What's that tell you? She said, oh, thank goodness, because now if I get an F, I'll still be a C, and I'm a C student. And sure enough, on her next college test, guess what happened? She got an F, and she ended up with a C. But he was using that as an illustration of how we wire our brains, that we convince ourselves of these kind of things. And, and this is what he asked her. He said, well, what had ha would have happened if your first test score had been an F? Well, she said, I would have studied like crazy, and I would have made sure and got an A so I could still be a C student. You catch that? It's math. It doesn't add up, right? But yet, we can see something, and we say, well, that's ludicrous. That's so silly. But yeah, we do those same things. And then, you know, that gets a little deeper with some of those things we've said already that, you know, if we grow up saying you can't do it, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you can't accomplish this, you can't do it on your own, you're not going to be able to get it done, those kind of things, then uh, what happens? A lot of times we grow up with that kind of mentality. Now, I was blessed and fortunate that my dad was the kind of guy that said, well, you know what, if you break it, if it's broken, you're smart enough, you can figure it out. You can get it done. No, there's a way to get around it. You know what to do. You've got to figure this out. Go after it. That's what we need to be wiring our brains to. And if you, any of you ever seen those TV shows, and I can't remember particular, but where they look in the mirror and they're like, you're pretty, you're smart, you're successful. You know, and they say all this kind of stuff in the, in the mirror. You know, it seems silly, but at the same time, as a Christian man of God, I need to be reading that Bible and saying, Holy Spirit, I want you to teach me and train me. So when I read that Bible, 
I am a disciple. I'm a believer. I am chosen. I am elect. I have been made for noble purpose. I am a warrior of God. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I am a royal priesthood. Man, that kind of stuff gets me pumped up. A lot better than saying, you're a loser. You're pathetic. You're no good. You need at least 20 pounds. You know, all this kind of stuff, right? Which one do you want to hear? This is what you need to be feeding on on a daily basis. When we talk about the head, you know, with this idea of the New Year's resolutions. Any of you make New Year's resolutions? There's been a discussion going on in my household because my wife says New Year's resolutions are dumb. And I, I'll protect her. I agree. But the premise of this is that, you know, we need to be making choices on a daily basis. And it all begins with a choice. Today could be that day of a choice. I can remember a friend of mine that became a Christian, and he literally, it was at Easter time. And so uh, he knew that he wanted to give his life to Jesus Christ. So he didn't go to church on Resurrection Sunday or Easter because he didn't want everybody in that church believing that he was a Christmas Easter kind of guy. So he went the Sunday after and went the rest of his life. Gave his life to Jesus Christ. But it begins with a choice. And so today, and we're asking you, make a choice mentally. I want a better year. I want to be a better Christian. I want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And I want to see someone else come to Jesus because of my relationship to Jesus Christ. So we look at this passage, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. I strongly recommend everyone in this room as a part of this choice, memorize the scripture. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It says there, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Man, that verse kept running through my mind because I'm not sure, I don't believe the guy that was sharing this brain knowledge stuff was necessarily a Christian man, but at the whole time that he was talking about rewiring your brain and that you speak to your brain and you tell yourself, I'm pretty, I'm pretty. And I didn't strap my, my drill in. Um, it's okay. No, I'm a loser now. Are you? See, encourage me. You know, we say these things. This is the essence of what we're talking about. To be obedient to who Jesus Christ says we are. We are to take captive every thought. Literally, the Bible tells us that we're to set our minds on things above that it, our brains are almost like a radio that you can tune. Any of you ever have trouble going, tonight, uh, going to sleep at night? You're dealing with emotions, feelings, all this stuff swimming in your head. Have you ever tried that? I know a lot of you have, and it's still difficult sometimes, but just stopping and praying, setting your mind to truth, quoting a scripture over and over, a truth of Jesus Christ in your head. The next part of what we look at is the heart. And as we look at the heart, I will look, read to you Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. I pray that out of the glorious riches, uh, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And we've mentioned this here in, in this church family before, but we're talking about that deep down place, your feeling, your gut, that inner part of you that you would allow God and Jesus to be in there and change you. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, if you were the only one sitting in this church building today, would you praise and worship God the same way that you're praising and worshiping Him now? Whether the person was sitting next to you, that's sitting next to you right now, whether you were all alone, would it change anything? How about if you were the only one that wanted to praise Jesus in the room today and everybody else wanted to do something else? Would it change anything? See, this is what we're talking about up here is that at the age of 17, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, it was a realization. I grew up in church all, every Sunday as a kid from the day I was born in a church similar to this. 
But it wasn't until the age of 17 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I opened up my heart and said, you know what? It's more than just words and teaching. It's a relationship. It changed everything. I mean everything. My circle of friends, my job, where I went to school, everything changed overnight. This is what happens when we allow the power and the truth of Jesus Christ into our heart. Now, here's the next part of this. We can't expect great things without Jesus. So if you're one of these New Year's resolutions kind of folks or you're wanting something different for this year, guess what? <laughs> Don't expect great things if you ain't got Jesus. We can't expect great things without Jesus. And this is what it says in Luke 9, 23. Then he said to all of them, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And what's the next part? And take up his cross daily and follow me. Who's he saying this to? Well, he's saying it to the disciples. So, you know, nowadays, oh, take up your cross. Oh, I'll get my, my cross necklace, and I've got my cross ring on today. He said, it's really cool. I just got it. Um, that's not what he's talking about. Can you imagine when Jesus said this to the disciples? Take up your cross and follow me daily, or daily and follow me. What was he saying? Oh, pick up your instrument of death and carry it with you and follow me. This was before Jesus died on the cross was crucified. They still knew what the cross was all about. Golly. What? Take up your cross daily and follow me? Jesus said it's all or nothing. Give your trust and hope totally to him. Follow after him, that deep heart, down inside place. These are the questions we ask on that. What is Jesus calling me to leave? When I come to Christ, when I claim Jesus, he wants to come in and have a relationship with me. He wants to change and mold me and make me into his beautiful creation. So the question is, what is Jesus calling me to leave? Maybe it would be busyness. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's a, your a hobby. Maybe it's a, an, an addiction you're dealing with. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe whatever it may be is everything, you know, that I lay all of that down. And then the next question is, what is Jesus telling me to pick up? For you personally, what is he telling you to pick up? Maybe it's purity. Maybe it's investment of time you remember that statement that we don't determine quality of time all we determine is quantity and in the midst of quantity quality is found do y'all believe that a lot of you are trying to squeeze quality time in with Jesus on a daily basis in this little bitty window and you're wondering why it doesn't seem like quality let me give you a suggestion start upping the quantity and all of a sudden quality is going to appear and don't make it just a one time in the morning kind of thing, but make it in your car. Make it at your lunchtime. Make it at your, uh, as you're working. Make it as when you're playing. Make it as when you're doing your hobby. Whatever it is, make that time be with Jesus and what he can do in you. And all of a sudden, you're going to see quality. And the last part of what we talk here is those hands. When we talk about hands, we're talking about that serving, what we're doing. And, and again, if you want to be empowered in the Lord Jesus Christ... There's got to be an action. When we talk about build, we're talking about being builders. And if we're not building, guess what? It ain't going to get done. Just like those projects back at home. You got, I've cleaned out a few closets. And I've got a bunch of closets that I always need cleaned out. But if you don't start with cleaning it out, what's going to happen? How many of you have ever been really negligent with a closet? Anyone? Anyone in here besides me? Anyone ever move that closet and then all of a sudden you find something on the wall back there or you find some things on the in the carpet you know little black things or whatever because it's been sitting there so long maybe it's just me never mind let me move on um if you don't clean that up what's going to happen it's going to get worse and you're going to end up throwing everything out empowerment comes when we allow god to work in us and through us and here's what we're really pushing as we talk about this is that as Christians, and we come into this room, we hear messages of good and truth and hope and all that. 
you know, you hear these things, go out, you got to do, you got to get to work, you got to read the Bible, you got to do all these things. I'm not telling you all that just to get you doing stuff. I want you to do it in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're doing it out of this love, not because it's something I feel like I have to do. Because when you feel like you have to do it and you're doing it because you feel like you have to do it, guess what we call that? That's called religion. We're talking about being empowered as God worked in us and through us. And here's what we read in John 15, 5. Anybody remember hearing this passage just a few moments ago in our communion meditation? I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. What is the condition? How does it work? If we remain in him. So guess what? If you're out there trying to prove that you're such a great Christian and all the stuff you're trying to prove and do, you're doing on your own ability, you ain't doing a very good job. Bottom line. I would rather see someone attempt to do something in the power and the name of Jesus Christ than for someone with great gifts and talent do something not in the name of Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? I would rather have a job that's not done quite as well by someone who's doing it by the power of Jesus than one from someone who is just doing it all on their own resources. This is what I'm trying to share with you. We walk out of this place. God has given every one of you in this room gifts and talents. But if you want to see them magnified and turned up, allow God in and take those gifts and talents and let him work in you through you as you express those gifts and talents next scripture we look at is act 4 13 when they saw the courage of peter and john and they realized that they were unschooled ordinary men what they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with jesus have you ever had somebody say that to you have you ever left out of church on sunday and went to one of our local restaurants and the waiter or somebody comes up to you and says, have you been with Jesus? Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen. But when you walk out of church or you're worshiping the Lord, there should be a sign of that. You know what's terribly unfortunate, especially here in our culture, is that most people... If they're going to say, have you been with Jesus? Then no, that's not the question a waiter or waitress is going to ask. They're going to say, what church did they come from? And usually it's with a scowl. Because it seems to be that when church folks rush out to restaurants, that a lot of times they're loud, they're rude, they don't tip well, they ignore their waiter or waitress, they just act like they're some higher servant. These are the comments that you hear all the time. Literally, a, a couple of months ago, I was sitting in Chili's. Waitress had no idea who I was or where I come from. But she was saying to me, I was like, how, how are you doing? Are you okay? She sits down at her table and starts to tell me, on Friday nights, when that one church gets out, then folk come in here and act like they own the place. Every time I come to the table, you know, it's like, oh, I need my drink refilled. And then I come back, and this person needs their drink refilled. Instead of everybody going, hey, who all needs a refill? Let's, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And this girl's stand, sitting there saying that to me, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and I'm a preacher. But I understand where you're coming from. And that shouldn't be the case. And do you know that night, I, I probably shouldn't have said where it was at. That night, I got the worst sandwich I've ever ha ate in my entire life. But I didn't say a word about it. I just ate the thing and gave the, one of the bigger tips that I probably ever give. By the way, I am a, and I'm just putting this out there because I'm a Christian and I feel like God calls us to be generous. I am a 20% or more tipper all the time. Whether I agree with the tipping or not, I'll do it because I want to show the love of Jesus Christ to whoever I'm in relationship with at that time. All right? As Christians, when you're in a restaurant, you represent Jesus Christ. 
When you're at Walmart, you represent Jesus Christ when you're with that cashier. When you're in the parking lot, we represent Jesus. When we're at the ball games and our kid is playing on the, on the, on the basketball court, guess what? We're representing Jesus Christ. All right? These are those things that are tough to, to learn. So here's the question, and this is what we wrap with today. What can I do? All right, well, we can start by making a choice of head, heart, and hands to be true followers of Jesus, to be disciples of Christ. But when we ask this question, what can I do? This first choice, attend a community activities to meet non-Christian. Now, I want you to understand, when I say to meet non-Christian, I'm not just saying that people that don't know Jesus are that project, and you just got to get them here, and once you get them here, you've fulfilled your, you know, your duties. These are people. We're talking about people. Pre-Christians, we like to reference them. But people that need Jesus. A disciple is one that looks for others that need the message and hope of Jesus, and we share that, and we live life with those folks. So, attend a community activities to meet non-Christians. Let me just say this fast before I read the other ones. As a pastor, I expect all of you to find something in your church family to be a part of, to be active. That's the body of Christ. But as a pastor, I also expect that you're finding somewhere outside this church building completely unassociated with us to do that as well. Second one, invite unchurched neighbors over to my house for a meal or game night or to watch a Super Bowl game or something like that. Serving at a nursing home or a retirement center. Participate in Little League and meet non-Christians or to be a coach or to do something of that nature. Invite non-Christian acquaintances to concerts and events at my church. Real quick note, because everybody's like, well, women, we had a concert here last. Hey, I want you to understand this in a church family. If there's something that you would see and want, and, you know, people come and say, hey, hey, Randy, let's do this, let's do that. I'm glad you volunteered. We need the collective mindset of our family doing activities. And, and a lot of you have hobbies and activities that, honestly, I'll try to say this real nice. I don't really care about. But I love you to death. Therefore, if you can share that hobby and stuff in a, in a setting of a church or ways that would be attracted to other people that like those hobbies, praise God. You know, that, if that's stuffing peppers with rice and tomatoes, that's just gross. But if that's what gets you, then go and use it to bring other people to Jesus. Serve on a community committees and meet non-Christians. I think we had that one twice. Serve at a local soup kitchen or rescue mission. Help with a church-sponsored harvest party. Offer Christian books or resources to people I know. I had that happen one time. I went to visit my uh, mom and dad at church back in my hometown. I was reading the book of Gary Chapman's Hope for the Separated. And I remember the guy in front of me going, I turned around and said, Hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a long time. Oh, my wife and I were separated and stuff. I'm like, here, have my book. I had it there at church. Might have been a God moment. Who knows? I think so. I gave him the book. You know, sharing those resources. Another way we do that in sharing resources is sometimes I come in contact with people in this community that I have no ability, it seems like, to communicate with or to figure out what they're into or how they do. But I know some of you all that are into that, and so you make those connections within the family. So what I would like, you, it doesn't have to be these nine, but for you to think. And so, you know, just you could choose one, two, three of these. As we point out here with these little check marks, just check off a few of those that maybe you can make it your goal. Again, I'll share with you right before we close up here um, this question, what is your identity? But I can remember about a decade ago, actually it was a little over a decade ago, I, went at, I was at... Uh, is it mom's kitchen it's gone now seems like, by the way if i ever eat at a restaurant and meet there for a morning breakfast group that probably means that your restaurant's going to go under 
seems like everyone I've ever been at, I'm sorry. So please don't tell anybody where about that, but that's just a little insider. Um, but a little over a decade ago, we were meeting together in this men's group, and we literally challenged each other as Christian men to quit complaining about Mount Vernon and start to make it a challenge for each one of us to either be on a school board, a city board, a city council, a county board, or something of that nature. Why? Because if you're not willing to be a part of the answer in healing and making God's kingdom and glory, then shut up and get out of the way. We have so many Christian men and women that just want to sit back and complain about things, but nobody wanting to step up into those places. Well, you know who makes the choices for this city, for this county, for this state, for this country? It's the people that get into those positions. And I tell you what, and maybe you don't agree, but I bet you do, we certainly need some God-fearing Christian men and women that are willing to step into those places it's tough but to step into those places maybe you're one of those people maybe God's calling you right now to make a choice to step into one of those places maybe it's your school maybe it's this city but whatever the case is I want to put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm going to put that trust in people that fear that God and love the Lord Jesus Christ as well so I want to pray on that today specifically as we look at what is our identity. Today I want to make a fundamental change in our identity that we are children of the Most High God and I'm a servant of the Most High God. Would you pray with me? Father, we give you the honor, the glory, the praise. Again, we recognize you as the authority above all things. The authority over my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, my choices, everything, Lord Jesus, you are above. You are the one that spoke this creation into existence. You're my life, the breath in my lungs. All of it is held together by you. So I put my trust and hope in you. And Lord, as we have looked at this identity today, I realize that I am a sinner that is saved by the blood of you, Jesus Christ. That my identity now is found in you. That I am a servant of you, Lord Jesus. I am a child of the Most High God that I am righteous and holy because of what you have done. So I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to work in my mind, to work in my heart, in my brothers' and sisters' minds and hearts, to make that change today. Help us, Lord, to find ways to allow you to work through us, to touch this community, this, this region, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to show that you are real and genuine, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. It's in your almighty name, Jesus Christ, we ask and pray this. Amen. Would you please stand as our praise team leads us in a time of decision. If you need to kneel here at the altar in prayer just between you and God and cry out to him, we encourage you to do that. If you haven't claimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I filled up the baptismal all the way to the top today. It's ready to come forward to confess his name and be baptized.
Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing this with us. Oh, 
your grace so free washes over me you have made me new and our life begins with you it's your prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he cancelled my debt and he called me his friend but when death was arrested my life began For your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new and our life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over So if you want to make uh, bring in donations for that, we need to have them here. Um, there's a sign up on the board out in the foyer. Uh, Wednesday morning Bible study, 930. We do have a sign up for giving statements uh, for the taxes and stuff for 2021. So if you sign up for that, um, we'll make sure and get you a statement on that. Office will be closed next Monday. However, next Monday uh, is a holiday we we're going to be taking down all the Christmas decorations. So if you can help out with that, that starts at 10 a.m. January 17th. Um, did one also announce <coughs> when we go out from here, you know, start in where you're at, okay? Don't feel like what you heard up here that you have to do it all this week. Start where you're at. And so one of those big things is Bible reading. If you haven't jumped in on the Bible reading plan, I'd encourage you to get into that. It's really good. You can see the comments from other people in the church family when you're on that program. But my encouragement to you is if you haven't started, 
start on the date that it actually is. Don't try to backdate and try to catch up. People get frustrated. And I would say, just curious, this is for my own study or thoughts. How many of you have read Genesis a number of times? The book of Genesis, the, the, the book of Genesis. How many of you have, that have raised your hands on that, haven't finished reading through the Bible ever? I would say Genesis is probably the most read book in the Bible because people jump in and say, I'm going to read the Bible this year. And then everybody reads through Genesis and then they start heading into Exodus and Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, and they start to lose interest. And so people read Genesis all the time, but never make it to the end of the book. So jump in where you're at. Keep reading a little bit each day. Was there any other announcements? Yeah, Maddie and Angie are being baptized next Sunday here in service, so I'd like to especially come celebrate that. And also, uh, I talked to Lisa this last week, the babies, the triplets, triplet boys that we had here uh, right at Christmas are doing well. And two of them, Jackson, Kai, are out, I believe, are home now, but Bodie is still needs a little bit more oxygen development along. So, anyways, keep praying on that. Pray for the family. A lot going on there. So, let me have a word of prayer real fast. We'll pray over that. And Father, we just give you the praise, glory, honor. Thank you again for a time of uh, study, worship, praise, honor, glory to you. Uh, Lord, we do lift up to you these little triplets. And we pray your hand of blessings upon them. Mom, Grandma, Grandpa, all the entire family. Uh, it's a whole family effort. So, we just pray for strength endurance through all of that and the praise of the baptisms next sunday we just rejoice and ask your blessing and hand on that as well you're so good praise be to you lord jesus my prayer as we leave is that you fill us with your wonder as we go out from here it's in your name jesus we pray amen thank you everybody i hope you have a great week um just have a great week <laughs>